We're seeing Paul fight for his folks in Galatia, fight for their souls, fight for their, even their bodies, fight against the agitators, and really unpack what it means to trust fully in Christ with, with all the faith that you have and to be indwelt by a spirit and what that looks like going forth. So we'll read this, Galatians 6, 11 through 18. Hear now the word of the Lord. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised, that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it for me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, Peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Father, now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight now. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer put back together in us what needs restored and renovate what needs taken out, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Will Ferrell is a genuinely funny comedian, and he reprises many roles throughout his comedy career. And um, one, one of, of the roles that he has reprised and comes out every so often at a comedy show is, is his role as Ron Burgundy in Anchorman. And he has a line in there. Again, it, it, it's not for children. I have to say that when I refer to a movie. Um, but he says this, this line. He says, I'm kind of a big deal. I don't know how to put this, but I'm, I'm kind of a big deal. People know me. I'm very important. I have many leather-bound books and my apartment smells of rich mahogany. Now, of course, he's a little too much stuck on himself. He's a comedian after all. He's, he's exaggerating the point that he thinks he's a big deal. And of all the things that Paul could end the book, the Gospel of Galatians with, he says that the Gospel is a big deal. It's a really big deal. This ending is terse. It's to the point. A lot of his other letter endings have a lot more different elements in them. This one does not. But this morning, in these short verses, we're going to see that the gospel is a big deal, and big books show it's a big deal. Big boasts show it's a big deal, and big blessings show it's a big deal. Big books, big boasts, and big blessings. Look in verse 11. He says, see with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. What do I say, books, books, this letter? He, Paul here uses the term letters in our English translations, and he's not merely referring to the scroll. Of course, they did not have bound books back then. They would write, write letters out on a, on, a, on a scroll, and they would roll it up and, and seal it and send it off. It was, that's how they processed it. That's how they moved it. And Paul is not, this word letters is not the word epistle. It's not a letter like he would refer to as other letters. The word refers to the actual letters that he writes. Paul says in this verse that I myself am writing large letters as I pen this letter. And why is that important? Well, in other places, Paul would use what's known as an amuensis. That's basically someone employed, a scribe, to write a letter. He would dictate this. And a, and, a, and a scribe would take it down. Not everyone in the ancient Near Eastern, first century ancient Near East was literate. Not everyone could write. Writing was a valuable occupation. And so Paul, what Paul is saying is that one, I have a bit of education. He's also saying I have a bit of authenticity here. That I think this is so important that I'm going to write this out myself. Some have speculated that that the reason he says large letters is because it refers to something wrong with him physically. 
Maybe because of all the stonings that he's endured, something is wrong with his eyes. He can't see, so he needs to write big letters, like the large print edition of the Reader's Digest. I'm dating myself there, I know. Perhaps he has an ailment with his hand all the time in prison has affected him. Maybe he has some kind of arthritis where he needs to write really large letters. Most likely the case that he is taking up the quill pen himself and writing by himself to make a further and final connection with the Galatians. This is what's known in Greek rhetoric as a force of personal appeal. Paul isn't in this for the fame or the fortune. He's in it for the affection that he has for his Lord and the affection that he has for the Galatians. So with some kind of great pain and great personal effort, he's going to take the pen up himself and write the entire. This would be a long letter in the ancient Near East. The time, the attention to detail. There was no white out or backspace. You just didn't start over on a scroll. And if you've ever written with a quill and a fountain pen, it's not a smooth process. Paul shows that the gospel is a big deal and it is formed in his heart a caring for the Galatians. And he says, I'm going to take this up with great affection, with great connection, and I'm going to write these letters with my own hand. The bottom line is that Paul cares not for fame, but he's willing to go to the ends of the earth and make ne enemies of necessary for the well-being of these people's souls. Paul cares genuinely and authentically for these people. He's not in it for the money, for the brand building, or for the fight. He's in it for the good news of the gospel. The gospel is a big deal because of big books and big letters. The gospel is a big deal because of not only big books, but big boasts. Big boasts. Four years ago, believe it or not, we were all coming out of about three months of this COVID, whatever your COVID experience was. And for me, one of the COVID experiences was the cancellations of, of sports. Now, I don't know about you, if you're a sports person, March, April, and May are gigantic on the sports calendar. NCAA March Madness, um, Masters, NFL Draft, uh, NBA, NHL playoffs. It is, it's, it's a sports lover's dream on the calendar. But with COVID, there was, there was hardly any of that. Well, ESPN released a 30 for 30 documentary called The, La the Last Dance, and it, and it documented Michael Jordan's experience of his six championships with the Chicago Bulls. Uh, m like, Michael Jordan is not just a basketball player. Some of you, you don't care a thing about basketball, but you've worn his t-shirts, you've worn his shoes. And um, Michael Jordan's coach during his run was uh, Phil Jackson. Phil Jackson won multiple titles with the Bulls and then later multiple titles with the Lakers. And he had an assistant named Tex Winters. Tex Winters ran a certain kind of offense known as the triangle offense. And that was his assistant coach. And, and Michael Jordan says this. There were so many times that Tex used to yell at me saying, move the ball, move the ball. There's no I in team. To which Michael Jordan said, there's an I in win. If you watch that documentary, if you know anything about Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan was a supremely confident athlete, and his, his confidence started in himself. There's no I in team, but there is a me. Michael Jordan would, would boast about um, and tell you about why, how he was better. He would, he would use it as motivational fuel when his general manager says something nice about another player, or when a newspaper would say something nice about another player, he would use it for fuel and drop 35, 40 points on him in a big game. Michael Jordan knew how to boast because he knew how to back it up. He's got, after all, six rings to prove it. Paul here says that there's some, gonna be some boasting going on. Look at verses 12 through 15. It's those who wanna make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised. And only in order that they may be persecuted, not, may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised, that they may boast in your flesh. But, but far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified me and I unto the world, for neither circumcision counts for anything, 
nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Paul says he's going to boast, but he's not going to boast like these agitators, like these deceivers. He's, in verse 12, he says, they want to make a good showing in the flesh who would be forced you to be circumcised. Paul is not about, this is the term saving face. They want to save face. They want to look good. They want to shame you to pump up themselves. Circumcision was a shame among the Greeks. They want them to do it, and they want the Galatians to receive the shame. That way they can pad their stats, grow their numbers. Paul says, I'm not going to boast in the works of the flesh. Look in verse um, 12. They want to make a good showing in the flesh. Verse 13, they do not keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in the flesh. Forcing, these people want to add burdens to you. They are the ones who are boasting in your work for themselves. They're forcing you to keep the law, but they're not even going to keep it themselves. You know, if you wanted to avoid persecution, you would denounce Christ. And you would go along with their wishes. See, by avoiding uh, Christ, they are avoiding the persecution that Christianity was seen as some, some cult, some anti-loyal zealotry. And Paul is saying that the work of Christ isn't some superficial mark of the flesh. We are not changed by doing something on the outside and it works its way in. But rather, the reverse. We are changed on the inside and it affects everything outside of us. Paul says, I'm not going to boast in others. Paul doesn't boast in his own ability here. He says that they think they have a high view, but they don't know half of it. If you read elsewhere in the New Testament, Paul documents his law-keeping resume. A Pharisee of the Pharisees. Circumcised the eighth day. Student of Gamaliel. When it came to law-keeping Pharisaical resumes, Paul was number one, top of the heap. And he says, these people don't have it. And they think they can keep the works of the law, and no one has. No one has. We have to ask ourselves, in what way are we trying to save face at the expense of the gospel? In what ways are we afraid to speak truth into a situation to avoid shame? In what ways are we trying to build our own resume, a plan B, a Jesus plus? You know, so it's just a backup plan and in case it really doesn't work. I want to show God I'm really serious, so I'm, I'm, I've, got, I've, got a, I've got an appendix, an addendum. I've got the deluxe package of righteousness. In what ways are we doing this? In what ways are we boasting of our own abilities? Hey, I, I've, I've kept the, ball, the law here, here, and here. I'm great. I'm much better than other folks. I'm not on the six o'clock news again for all the wrong reasons. I would never be caught in sin X. Is that the kind of self-righteousness that we're, we're, we're self-deceived by? Is that something we don't even know? Or rather, can we say with Paul in verse 14, far be it from me to boast. I'm not going to boast in my record keeping. I'm not going to boast in my converts. I'm not going to boast in my missionary trips. I'm not going to boast in my persecutions. I'm not even going to boast about all these letters I've written. But I'm going to boast in the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross of Jesus Christ means sinful humanity and the animating principle of sin is put to death. I don't have to sin any longer. I don't have to buy into what the world is selling. I don't have to buy into the animating principle that I have to achieve my own identity rather than receive it. Paul says here in verse 14 that the world has been crucified. This is a certain kind of ver verb that denotes past action and has ongoing present ramifications. The cross of Christ has radically altered our lives and it's radically altered history. We say, why should we boast in a medieval torture device? One, because it's empty along with the tomb. No one else has risen from the dead except Jesus Christ. But I would say that's a wrong question. Instead of asking why should we boast, I would say why shouldn't we? Why shouldn't we? What else will we boast in? Whatever else we can construct will pass away with this world. Whatever else we can, we can boast in in our own works, it will pass away. 
Boasting comes naturally to us. Did you know that? As humans, boasting comes naturally. I'm going to refer to C.S. Lewis in his reflection on the Psalms. I have never noticed that all enjoyment spontaneously overflows into praise. The world rings with praise. Lovers praising their mistresses. Readers their favorite poet. Walkers praising the countryside. Players praising their favorite game. I had not noticed either that just as men spontaneously praise whatever they value, so they spontaneously urge us to join them in praising it. Isn't she lovely? Isn't it glorious? Don't you think that's magnificent? The psalmist and telling everyone to praise God are doing what all men do when they speak of what they care about. My whole more general difficulty about the praise of God, depending on my absurdly denying to us as regards the supremely valuable what we delight to do, what indeed we can't help doing about everything else we value. I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise is not merely, it not merely expresses, but completes the enjoyment. My friends, we are hardwired to boast and praise something, and we will either find it in counterfeits or we'll find it in the genuine artifact. The good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of you know what it is to boast. I'm going to ask you about your grill and what was on it over the last couple days. I'm going to ask you about your favorite sports team. I'm going to ask you about your favorite blog. I'm going to ask you about that, that sale you just found. And you're going to boast about it. And the reason we boast about Jesus and an empty cross is one, because it's true. Two, because it's good. It is right. It's what putting this, this world together again. It is beautiful. It is lovely for someone to come and undertake our souls where we could not do so. We boast because Jesus is able to deliver. The gospel is a big deal. Big books show it's a big deal. Big boasts show it's a big deal. And lastly, big blessings show it's a big deal. Look at verses 16 through 18. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. For now on, let no one cause me trouble. For I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Blessings gets a little overused. We're familiar in this part of the country with the term, bless your heart. Wikipedia rightly says this phrase has multiple meanings and is used to express Genuine sympathy, but sometimes as an insult that conveys condescension, derision, or contempt. It may also be spoken as a precursor to an insult to mitigate its severity. Hashtag blessed. Blessings. There's a whole aisle on Hobby Lobby with blessings you could put all up over your house. There's a big difference between bless your heart between what a southern mom would say about um, the principal who didn't get it right and say about what Gandalf said about the new king of Gondor, Aragorn. Now come the days of the king. May they be blessed. Paul is saying in this blessing not a condescension, not a cliche, but an echo of the Old Testament. All these folks in Galatia who were familiar with the Old Testament would be intimately familiar with the idea of blessing. Paul says, I want to grant mercy and peace for those who walk. Who are those who walk? The stoicheia, the elemental elements, those who follow in the footsteps of the Holy Spirit, as we saw in Galatians 5, 25, who exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. Those who adhere to a standard, those who buy into the canon, the animating principle of love, trailblazed by the Holy Spirit. We live in line with the Holy Spirit. Paul says, mercy and peace on those who have trusted Christ for their righteousness, have received the Holy Spirit, and who are living like it. Paul also says in verse 17 that there's a blessing from marks. He says, I bear in my body the marks of Jesus. This is the term where we get our word stigma. It had the idea, it was used in uh, first century for followers of different gods who would tattoo the name or likeness of their God on them. It was used commonly in the first century where slave owners would brand their slaves 
and leave an indelible mark on them as a mark of ownership. Paul says here that I bear in my body these marks. They've come from, from persecution. They've come from preaching the gospel. And it means that the true marks of following Jesus aren't in circumcision. They're not in works of the flesh. But they're rather evidence of union with Christ born out of the fruit of the Spirit. One church father said, all that Christ experienced on the cross, the imprint of the nails, the spear thrust in his side, the other marks of the crucifixion, I bear in my own body. Paul blesses those who are the true Israel of God, the Israel of God by faith. And Paul says that I bear in my marks that I am owned by Christ. I am, I am marked by Christ. Paul blesses with mercy and peace. He blesses with marks and he blesses with mutuality. Look in verses 18. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Why is this blessing important? Well, from a literary aspect, this is a bookend, what we know as an inclusio for you linguists. Paul here bookends this blessing on the backside with the, the blessing in verses chapter 1, 3 and 1, 6. But it's also important because of this. Do you remember what Paul was doing in the first chapter? If, if we or someone else preaches a, another gospel, let him be what? Anathema, cursed. If an angel from heaven comes down and preaches another gospel, let him be cursed. Paul is specifically putting together this blessing here at the end with a curse from the beginning and saying, cursed are those who bring another gospel, but those who have wholly bought into are wholly trusting in Christ and it's been counted to them in righteousness, blessing be upon you. In the Old Testament, these folks familiar with it would, would understand the, the Aaronic blessing, the blessing from Aaron. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Paul is saying, may the Lord pay attention to you. May he visit in on you and look in on you. May he come to share fellowship with you. May God come and sit on your front porch. You see, this is good news, my friends, because we don't, have to, we don't have to make our own marks in the body. We don't have to construct our own resume of works. See, the good news is the cross is empty. Jesus has come. His work is finished. The good news is that we, we boast in marks, but not our own. We boast in the marks of Jesus Christ. We, we boast in the the scars in his hands and the scars in his feet and the mark in his side. Those are life to us. That's why this is good news. It's good news because Jesus came under the law, lived under the law, died under the law, and rose that we might be free from the law and free to follow him. Jesus, this is good news because at the end of verse 15, for, for neither circumcision counts for anything but un, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation this news is so good, it's so big, it's so powerful that it will renew the entire heavens and the earth. That when Jesus comes, we will not just be freed to sit on a harp, to sit on a cloud and strum a harp like a chubby baby. No, Jesus' work is so magnificent and it's so big and it's so powerful that we will be restored in our souls and restored in our bodies and live in a curse-free renovated new heavens and new earth. That's one of the blessings we have to look for. That's, that's peace. Everything, shalom, everything as it should be. And the good news is you don't have to be mutilated for that. Christ was mutilated on the cross. That you don't have to work and add a Jesus plus or add something to that or hedge your bets. No, Jesus has walked out of the tomb for you, the good news is that there's an empty tomb and is a risen Savior. My friends, the gospel is a big deal because it's going to renew all things. And we're just waiting on the clock. We're just waiting on the clock. Um, the field, it, it's summertime, so it's baseball season, and um, one of the great sports movies is Field of Dreams. And, and, uh, 
Major League Baseball has constructed a stadium. They, they play a Field of Dream games every year out in the middle of a cornfield in Iowa. It's a star-studded movie. Uh, Kevin Costner, James Earl Jones, among others. And at the end of it, you know, Ray's, Ray's farm is going to be foreclosed on because he's used valuable real estate to build a baseball stadium. And he's frittering his time away playing baseball instead of farming the land. And one of his friends or relatives is trying to get him to sign papers, do a short sale so he doesn't lose everything. And James Earl Jones has that great monologue. Ray, people will come, Ray. They'll come to Iowa for reasons they can't even fathom. They'll turn into your driveway not knowing for sure why they're doing it. They'll arrive at your door as innocent as children longing for the past. Of course we won't mind if you look around, you'll say. It's only $200 per person. And they'll pass over the money without even thinking about it. Whereas money they have and peace they lack. And they'll walk off to the bleachers and sit in their short sleeves on a perfect afternoon and find they've reserved seats somewhere along the baseline where they sat when they were children and cheer their heroes and they'll watch the game and it'll be as if they dip themselves in magic waters. The memories will be so thick They'll have to brush them away from their faces. People will come, Ray. Best line in the whole thing. Whereas money they have, but peace they lack. My friends, the Apostle Paul offers us this morning the big deal, the good news of the gospel, that one day everything will be as it should be. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, this is good news to our soul. Um, we are tempted to add on. We are tempted to hedge our bets. We're tempted to supplement. Lord, give us free hands and pure hearts and souls that cast ourselves on Jesus, that we would, as Abraham, that we would believe, just believe 100% holy your promises that it would be counter to us as righteousness, that we would believe and walk in the Spirit, that we'd be freed from the idols of this world and would instead follow you in the way that we may experience this blessing of everything as it should be, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As our children return, uh, I want to say thank you all for being here this morning. If you're a first-time guest, there's a card. In the front there, we'd love to have a record of your visit just to follow up with a note that says thank you. We won't put you on any lists or give your, your, your email to any other uh, entity or corporation. We do have a gift for you at the back.